Uh, Kuiper belt. Uh, Trans-Neptunian objects of the solar system, as it says there. Uh, what I'm going to actually talk about is basically it's what I call a Cook's tour of the Kuiper belt. So I'm going to sort of dash through uh, what it is. So basically what, where and how big, the name, how did it get there, who discovered the first, how are they catalogued, how are they classified into groups and orbits, Kuiper and beyond, plus Planet Nine, relationship with comets, uh, we'll have a quick look at binaries, Pluto, and then Arakoth, and what's next for the uh, New Horizons probe. So that, that's basically what the, the rundown is going to be. So where is the Kuiper belt? Uh, probably most of you will be aware. It's that region of the solar system beyond Neptune. Uh, it has an end, which uh, depending who you read or which book you pick up, it could be at 548 AU, it could be at 55 AU, it could actually be a bit further on. Um, nobody's actually clearly defined where the edge, uh, that far edge of the Kuiper belt is. Sometimes the inner edge is put about 35 AU. A lot of people now put it at 30 AU, which is the orbit of Neptune, because uh, the Neptunian Trojans are now sort of added into the group called the Kuiper Belt. Uh, beyond the Kuiper Belt, we get things called the Hills Disk and the Oak Cloud. So, how big is it? Uh, well, I'm going to compare it with the asteroid belt. So here's the uh, a little bit of maths, so I'm afraid I'm going to put you through a bit of maths as a, somebody who used to teach engineering and physics and uh, science. Uh, I, yeah, I like a bit of maths in a, in a talk. Uh, so, the asteroid belt, it's from 2.2 to 3.2 AU wide. Um, inclination of most asteroids about 10, 20 degrees, and we can sort of consider it to be a torus with the inner radius little r on that uh, on the diagram up here uh, to be 2.2 au and the big r is 3.2 and with a bit of twiddling with your mass pi h pi r squared uh, is the, the volume of a cylinder we can work out that the volume of that torus containing a lot of the asteroid belts about 34 cubic au and about two years ago uh, there was over a million main belt objects listed. Uh, there's probably a lot more now because we're, we're, these telescopes we have now are, uh, are pulling hundreds out uh, every month. Uh, trying the same thing for the Kuiper belt, so we we'll say 30 to 55 AU, we'll still say 20 uh, degrees inclination which will uh, uh, taking the bulk and we get a volume of 200,000 cubic AU. So it's a lot bigger space, a lot bigger volume and as of November 2021 there are four th only 4,008 KBOs listed. Uh, so the mass of uh, the asteroid belt is only about 4% of the moon in total. Sarah's, uh, the biggest, uh, got about 30% of the total of the mass of the asteroid belt. If you have that sort of material density within the Kuiper belt, we'll get a total mass round about a Jupiter. Uh, so again, one million objects in the main belt, the average separation comes out about three million miles. Uh, we've only got 4,000 Kuiper belt objects at the moment, so that separation comes out at about 3.7 AU. If you have a million in the Kuiper belt, then they're still only they're still 52 million miles apart. So it may not be quite as uh, populated in terms of uh, how close things are together in the Kuiper belt. But uh, I mean, we, we've hard we've hardly started seeing these things at the moment. Uh, if you've got the same separation as the asteroid belt, then there's over about 5 billion objects uh, if it was at the same separation. So, uh, 
Kuiper. I got its name. Gerard Kuiper, 1905 to 1973, professor at Chicago. Uh, he published a paper in 1951. It actually was an anti Kuiper belt paper because what, what he was saying was that uh, uh, objects would be scattered out to the Oort cloud by a massive Pluto because at that, in 1951 they thought Pluto was uh, more Earth size, uh, more Earth mass than what we know now. So what, what he was uh, saying that there were bodies out beyond Pluto, beyond Neptune, but they were being scattered out into the Oort cloud. And that was helping build the cold cloud up for, for comets. So it was sort of predicting the Oort cloud wouldn't be as it is. Uh, he also, quite interestingly, got involved in something called Project A119 because he uh, he walked with, worked with a postdoctoral student called Carl Sagan, who I'm sure you've heard of. And Project A119 was a, a really a strange project developed by the United States Air Force in 1958. And the basic idea was to, to send a, a nuclear bomb to the moon, uh, have a flash so that everybody could see the flash of the atom bomb uh, going off on the moon. And uh, it would show the Russians uh, the technology the Americans had. It was a, a rather a strange concept. And considering Carl Sagan was quite a pacifist in his later life anyway. Yeah, that's just an aside. It could have been called the Leonard Belt, Edgeworth Belt. In fact, sometimes it is called the Edgeworth Kuiper Belt. Uh, Leonard, Fred Charles Leonard uh, from uh, University uh, uh, of University College of Los Angeles, uh, he'd mentioned in 1930 that Pluto might be the first of a series of ultra Neptunian bodies, uh, which are waiting to be detected. Uh, Edgeworth, he wrote a, a paper uh, in just in 43 on the evolution of our planetary system in the BAA journal. And he was suggesting that there was a, a vast reservoir of cometary material just beyond the orbit of Neptune. And this was seven years before uh, Jan Oort made his uh, suggestion about the Oort cloud and eight years before Kuiper uh, published his paper. So, Sometimes we do get the Kuiper belt called the Edgeworth Kuiper belt. How did it form? Uh, there is something called the Nice model. Uh, it's not a nice model, it's the Nice model after the French town. Uh, it had a, a conference in 2005 and uh, some papers in there uh, were presented, uh, basically working out that the uh, the development of the solar system involved the movement of Neptune. And what that paper is saying, that Neptune actually formed between Saturn and Uranus. And at some stage in the early life of the solar system, mainly due to resonances between Jupiter and Saturn, that the, the gravitational twitch due to Jupiter and Saturn caused, caused Neptune to be uh, ejected further out into the solar system, passing Uranus, which uh, I still don't quite understand how it managed to do that, but uh, that's what the team and uh, Neptune ends up uh, out beyond uh, 2530 AU. Uh, and as it moves out, it is moving material that's in the solar system out with it. Uh, Basically, what they were looking at is a, a, a lot of uh, primordial disk material, asteroidal material, uh, stuff that's not come together to form planets, that's forming a disk. We, we see these on uh, the infrared pictures that we, we see from uh, uh, things like the James Webb Telescope, when they, they uh, photograph uh, uh, new stars and you, you see these disks of uh, material round stars in, in uh, infrared. And here is sort of a, a progress of Neptune. So here's Neptune in the early solar system, somewhere around about 26, 27 AU out. Uh, here we've got a, a red line which represents all these uh, 
disc material, the unformed uh, protoplanet stuff. And as Neptune moves out, it starts to upset this material. And some of this material gets trapped in orbital resonances with Neptune. So here we are at uh, something like 28 million years, 32 million years, 40, 60, 80, 100, 140, 160. And as Neptune moves out to its 30 AU position, <coughs> these small bodies get trapped, some of them get trapped into resident uh, orbits uh, with Neptune. And if we look at actually the real picture of what we've actually currently observed with this sort of computer model, that's what we see. So here's the computer model. Here is uh, a plot of the trans-Neptunian objects we've got. And we see bodies in resonant positions that actually quite nicely agree with these lines that the computer worked out. And what it's suggesting is that material got moved out, some of it got trapped within uh, resonances with Neptune. And uh, here's a, a clearer picture. So you've got Pluto in one of these resonances, the two, three resonances. So you've got material that's uh, called resonant objects, and they can have quite high eccentricities because uh, the, the uh, mean distance has moved out, but uh, the perihelion and the aphelion are actually stretched because of this movement uh, they've done. Uh, you get classical ones that have uh, nearly circular orbits. Uh, you've got scattered disk ones that are far out, and they have perihelion greater than 30 AU, high inclination and eccentricity. And they think they've been scattered out by uh, Neptune, but haven't fallen into a, a resonance. And then you've got these things called detached objects. These have a greater perihelion. And they're thought not to be really affected by anything that's going on in the in the solar system. They're, they're too far out. Um, uh, we like to give things names and stuff further out are called said noise because uh, we've got a we found a a, a trans uh, a Kuiper belt object, a trans Neptunian object, uh, which we call said noise, which is quite a, a large object. It's Pluto size, which is really really far out. So the first Kuiper belt object was uh, discovered by David Jewett and uh, Jane Lou. Uh, David Jewett, British, uh, so we can wave a flag for him. Uh, he actually works uh, uh, in America. He has done uh, for a long time uh, in uh, UCLA. Uh, he discovered as a, a postgraduate student the, uh, the Jovian moon Adrastia, which is the, the second one out from Jupiter, from the Voyager photographs. Uh, and currently he's, uh, he's made 48 minor planet discoveries. He was also the, the astronomer that the first detected Halley on its 1986 perihelion return. Uh, Jean -Lou, Jane Lou uh, now works in uh, University in Boston, uh, and she, she's actually quite credited with uh, discovering 37 minor planet objects. Albion, it's technically the second Kuiper belt object because the first one is actually Pluto. It's 100 kilometers in diameter, so it's, it's a good size. It's 40, 44 AU out, it takes 290 years to go around the sun, and it's got an eccentricity of 0.07. So it's called a cold classical object. Uh, cold, uh, I'll probably talk about that in a bit, but cold means it was there from the start. Uh, you get hot ones, that are the ones that have been moved out by uh, Neptune. Classical is, it's out in the, the classical Kuiper belt. Uh, we've touched, uh, Chris, I think, touched on it uh, earlier. 
how does it sort of uh, monikers QB1 uh, it gives uh, it gave it the name to type of object QB QB1 O's uh, but uh, basically I asked the question how do you get the, these designations can we have an R2D2 a C3PO or even an OB1 uh, well basically uh, how they uh, annotate minor pl planet discoveries uh, these include asteroid belts objects as well as Kuiper belt objects uh, uh, so in 2023 the first minor planet discovery of January the 1st, what we call 2023AA. And then we'd go on to 2023AZ, and then we'd be followed by 2023AA1. Uh, and that happens for the first fortnight. the first letter a is used for the first fortnight of the year uh following the end of the first half month the next body to be discovered would be 2023 ba and you get uh bb bc bd and then back to ba1 etc uh so ob1 uh ob1 would be the 26th object uh of discovered in the period of july the 16th to july the 31st and in fact there was a an asteroid 2012 OB1 uh, which actually passed within 0.2 AU of the earth in 2012 it was a, a kilometer in sight uh, and uh, uh, basically they spotted it and then they've not seen it since so uh, you know there are OB1s out there So back to the Kuiper Belt. Uh, here is uh, sort of a map. So you've got Neptune and the Trojans at 30 AU. We've got all these resonances: four, five, two, three, three, five, four, seven, one, two resonances. Here's Pluto, and objects called Plutinos. Uh, there is a two, three resonance with Neptune. Uh, distance of a average distance 39.5. 5AU semi major axis uh, between Neptune and Pluto is what's called the inner belt, and you've got the classic belt that goes out to about 48AU, the, the, the one to two resonance with Neptune, where an object at that point goes around once around the sun for every two orbits of Neptune, uh, and then extended belt that goes out to about 50. Uh, the resonance of uh, two to five and something that's called the Kuiper cliff and then you've got other resonances further out uh, there, there's Eris uh, which is another Kuiper belt object uh, sat round about 66 AU and we've got a lot more other stuff out going way out uh, to the 2000, over 2000 AU Currently, we've got uh, seven objects that are greater than a thousand kilometer in diameter. Uh, so there are some large lumps out there, uh, minor planets. Uh, between Mars and Jupiter, we've only got three bodies greater than 500. In the Kuiper belt, we've so far discovered 38 bodies greater than 500 kilometers and 121 greater than 200 and to be fair we only just really began to see these objects that's a sort of a plot of the objects that we see and here we've got something called the Kuiper belt I'll, I'll talk again about it i'll bring it up again in a bit uh is it a real thing uh is it because these in this area here things are so far away that we're actually not seeing them uh, the eccentricity we're, we're picking these up because they've got a high eccentricity uh, Buffy this is its semi-major axis we're actually picking it up here because it's got a, a high highish eccentricity
We talked earlier about the hot and the cold. The, the hot objects are the ones that have been pushed out by Neptune. They tend to have high inclinations, high eccentricities. Uh, the cold ones, uh, Arakos uh, would fit into that. It's got a nice circular orbit. It's fairly low on its inclination. It's thought to have been there really since the dawn of the solar system. look at the chemistry uh, a lot of the Kuiper belt objects come out as red uh, there's a lot of frozen volatiles there uh, nitrogen methane uh, carbon dioxide uh, they're all seen in the reflection spectra of objects like Triton and Pluto and Maki Maki in fact we, we've seen methane and net, uh, nitrogen on Pluto. Uh, many of these objects have a reddish appearance due to uh, material called tholins. Uh, tholins are uh, polymer-like materials built from the basics of methane and nitrogen and carbon monoxide. Uh, they don't form naturally on Earth uh, but they seem to form out in uh, in speed space uh so it was actually uh coined by carl sagan uh when uh, to describe some of the materials obtained in what was the miller uh, experiments uh you may remember miller was the guy who uh, put some of this stuff into a uh, a flask uh, water and carbon dioxide and methane and put electric sparks into it and formed basic amines and uh, organic material uh, and some of these are what we call tholins uh, just by sparking this material for some time uh, in his laboratory uh, so it's thought these materials are formed actually just over billions of years by the, the action of the sun's radiation on on the material uh, making up uh, these uh, uh, objects out there. So you can see the temperature. So Triton being going around Neptune is quite warmer than Pluto and Eris and Sedna, uh, which is quite a cold object. So looking at objects we have, uh, Neptunian Trojans. There's some great big beasts out there. Uh, 29 as of February 2020 uh, quite large in size 200 kilometers some of them 100 kilometers um, Jupiter further in has got over 9800 Trojans but only 19 of these are greater than 100 uh, Neptune uh, 24 we've picked up at L4 currently we've only seen four at L5 but L5 is hiding in Sagittarius uh, and because of how slow Neptune moves around uh, the uh, solar system uh, it uh, I, th I think it uh, basically moves only a, a few degrees along the ecliptic every uh, every year so it's a while before the L5 point, point moves out of Sagittarius uh, and enables us to detect something more. When the Vera Robin telescope starts uh, observing in uh, in a few few months' time, I think it's open. That's going to be photographing the the sky in from the southern hemisphere, basically every few days, and uh, the entire sky. And it's open to get down to about. Issue 25, 26. So that may involve a big rush of uh, objects it may find, and it may find uh, a lot more uh, Neptunian Trojans. Uh, one of those is called a, a jumping Trojan. So here's the, the leading uh, Lagrange point where these things orbit around. This is the, the trailing Lagrange point uh, in an orbit and a jumping trojan it can actually move from one of these to the other uh, in, in what's called a, a horseshoe orbit uh, 
Plutinos, well, Pluto is, is the main one. Uh, again, some really nice big beasts. So there's Pluto, uh, which, you know, we've still got a debate whether it's a planet or not. Uh, it's been, it's a dwarf planet according to the IAU. 2,300 kilometers in diameter. Uh, here we've got Orcus, 9, 900 kilometers. So these are, are quite large objects, uh, basically sharing the same semi major axis as Pluto. Uh, I've put here just out of interest uh, the number of moons. So Pluto's got five moons, the biggest of which is uh, a, a large object of its own right, over a thousand uh, kilometers in diameter. Uh, Orcus has got a moon, 400 kilometers. Uh, so is Hoya, and uh, this one down here has got one 100 kilometers. So they've got fairly big double systems. Uh, Nearly just under 10% of all Kuiper Belt objects discovered are Plutinos in this orbit, 39 uh, AU. Uh, and sometimes this is defined as the start of the Kuiper Belt. As I say, sometimes it is the orbit of Neptune. Don't confuse Plutinos with another name, which is a Plutoid. A Plutoid is a trans-Neptunian object that's large enough to be rounded in shape. A hydrostatic equilibrium makes a, a round object like Pluto, like Ceres in the uh, asteroid belt. Then we get classical uh, objects, and I've detailed whether these are hot or cold. And I explain cold objects we think were there from the start of the uh solar system and hot objects are objects that have been pushed out into the uh, kuiper belt through uh, the movement of neptune uh, again i've mentioned some of these have uh, have moons again we've got the maki maki over nearly one and a half thousand kilometers in diameter qr uh over a thousand again 1100 large objects and quite a few of these we've detected moons around them in fact quite are uh just a few weeks ago i had a ring as we've discovered that it's got a ring as well and uh, they're just puzzled about that because the ring is outside what would be its roche limit so they're not sure why uh, that ring is there. So uh, that's that's basically how the classic belt is. Here's Arikoth that uh, the New Horizons probe uh, went past. It's quite a tiny object, 31 kilometers diameter. I mean, it, we, we all seen it's like a it's two lumps stuck together. So uh, defining uh, a diameter of something like that is uh, slightly difficult and then we get to what could be considered the edge of the classic belt the two tinos again we've got large objects objects with moons uh, a two tino it's a trans neptunian object that orbits once for every two orbits of neptune it's sometimes considered the outer edge uh, but uh, and depending on the source, we, the, we've identified either 73 or 99 uh, objects to be two Tinos currently. So here's all all the resonances. So we've got the one-to-one -one resonance, which are the Trojans. Uh, 29, we think we've got. Uh, four to five. Here's the sort of the classic. Uh, Kuiper belt, uh, Plutinos here, 383 of those we've discovered, uh, an immense number. The two Tinos, 99. Uh, and then something called the Kuiper cliff, where we think there's a sudden uh, drop in the number of objects seen. 
might be real it actually may be just due to observation these things are far away very faint we just don't see them because they are very faint but resident objects go right out at the moment to what's called 19 uh 129 au uh we've got two that we're thought to be in that resonance and if you plot some of these objects so here's the kuiper belt in, in green and you can see that there seems to be a definite taste this kuiper cliff uh, which is it may be real it may not be real and then get we've got detached objects we've got said noise we've got the scattered disc going way way out sedna uh semi-major axis is over 500 au it's a uh, thousand kilometers in uh, diameter would take it about 11,000 11 and a half thousand years to go around the sun uh it's sort of the, the mother of the sednoids uh there's another one here uh 4,000 AU out. I mean, we're, we're getting really out in the outer reaches of the solar system. Uh, Sedna was actually discovered uh, when it was not only 90 AU from the sun. If you look at the eccentricity, it's got a very high eccentricity. Same with this one here, eccentricity 0.98. That's almost comet-like. Uh, in its uh, in its orbit it's got a very high ecliptic elliptical orbit uh here you've got uh, eris uh scattered disk it's got a moon uh similar size to pluto 2300 kilometers in diameter uh so there's some some large bodies out there uh 332 scattered disc and detached objects plus 27 sednoids so we talk about other things uh that come actually closer in is uh, uh damocloids centaurs um these are things that are probably kuiper belt objects uh they go out that far and then get thrown in Halley's Comet uh, if it stops being a comet it may become uh, what's called a, a damocloid these are probably just dead comets uh, they've got high eccentricities uh, they go out beyond the orbit of Pluto into the Kuiper belt but come in close to uh, closer into the uh, inner solar system so there might be dead comets the uh, you know uh, they've just uh, given up the all the material that can be all the volatiles as they, they've passed into the inner solar system and, and Halley's Comet may do the same in uh, a few thousand years time uh, these two here are retrograde which is typical of comets that probably got disturbed by something further out and got thrown into the system so those are just objects that mainly have a mean distance between neptune and jupiter possibly ex kuiper belt objects uh these two here of interest because they've got they've got rings so not just planets have rings uh some of these sort of asteroid type bodies have have rings around them So we get this this plan again of where the classical ones are, where the scattered are the detached sednoids up here. We've got resonant objects, we've got the Neptune Trojans, and then here we've got the Centaurs and uh, Damocloids coming in closer than Neptune. So farther out, well, you've got the Hills Cloud Hills disc, Jack Hills. Uh, uh, came from the University of Kansas. He, he thought that the inner part of the Oort cloud would provide more material for comets and would be more gravitationally bound for the sun. Uh, 
objects uh, ejected from the hills cloud uh, could end up in the classical Oort cloud region and maintain the Oort cloud. Uh, he reckons it would be more denser than the Oort cloud. Uh, There was the the Oort cloud was uh, brought up by this bloke, John Oort. Uh, I'll just go back to there. Uh, I've put on the the distances of the uh, sort of the distant probes. So uh, Voyager One is currently 159 AU, Pioneer 10 133. New Horizons is at 55 AU, so it's just coming to the end of. Um, what is the sort of the classical Kuiper belt as of March 31st, 2023. Uh, the Oort cloud, Jan Hort, uh, he, uh, he predicted that there's this large cloud of material that provides all the comets that uh, come in uh, on uh, the, the long orbits. Uh, We've not got any uh, real evidence of that apart from these very long period orbits. Uh, Oort cloud extends technically from 20,000 AU out to 50,000. Inside that we've got what's called the Hills disk now. Uh, and basically I wonder how the Oort cloud has managed to exist for basically four and a half billion years as the sun's trogged around the uh, the galaxy uh, at 20,000 AU uh, an object going around the sun uh, would have an orbital speed of about 500 miles an hour it'd be moving very slow it'll take it 2.8 million years to go around that's basic Kepler mass at 50,000 AU it takes 11 Point two million years ago, and your yeah, orbital speed is down to three hundred and fifteen miles per hour. It's sort of jet jet engine uh, jet engine speed. So uh, uh, it's they're not moving very fast. And if you consider uh, at fifty thousand AU from the sun, uh, in direct line with Alpha Centauri, uh, it's two hundred seventy thousand AU from Alpha Centauri. <coughs> if we remove the sun and if an object at that distance at 27,000 AU from Alpha Centauri using Kepler and Alpha Centauri basically there's two stars so it's, it's mass twice that of the, the sun uh, the orbital speed will be 26 miles an hour so uh, it's a it's six or seven percent of the gravitational pull of the sun so Alpha Centauri could be disrupting uh, the material uh, out in the Oort cloud quite easily at a distance of four light years. Um, here's some uh, uh, a comet with a, a, a aphelion of uh, two and a half thousand AU. In about 1.3 million years time, uh, a star Gliese 710, it's a K7 star with about 60% the solar mass, there's a prediction that it's going to pass within 10,000 AU of the Sun. Uh, they've measured, looked at a star called Schultz star, 80,000 years ago it passed within 30,000 AU, it's an M9 binary, a uh, red dwarf binary, 10% of solar mass but uh, that is within the constraints of the Oort cloud. And as you see, Comet McNaught, last of Helion was 67,000 AU. Comet C 2017 TU, the last of Helion was thought to be 74,000 AU. So actually, are they members of the Sun's family or have we acquired them from elsewhere? I mean, I think the Oort cloud in my mind it's a bit fuzzy. How has it managed to last there for untouched for four and a half billion years? Planet Nine? There was some speculation a few years ago because when they looked at the orbits of some of these uh, Kuiper Belt, these long distance scattered 
disc objects, sednoids. Uh, all the orbits seem to be pointing in a sort of a similar direction and they are wondering whether that's been constrained by some sort of unknown planet nine. Uh, I think some of this has been discredited since, uh, but again, uh, my penchant uh, for mass, uh, I looked at Neptune, it's magnitude eight at 30 AU. If we put a, a Neptune sized planet at 300 AU, that's 10 times the distance. So that's a hundred fold decrease in its brightness or five magnitudes, but it's also getting a hundredth of the Right from this another five magnitude so that would be at 308 u neptune would be at magnitude 18. we'd, we'd have probably seen it with modern asteroid searchers but take it another 10 times further out it drops to magnitude 28. so at 3000 au neptune would be quite difficult to see uh, and if we look at an earth-sized body uh, you probably need to add at least another three magnitudes uh, so you're probably down into magnitudes of 30 to see something that big, that far out. Coming for Belt Park comets. Uh, well, here's some 1843. Uh, it's uh, AU, 78 AU for its semi-major axis. Uh, it was visible in daylight. Now oh, that would be a nice thing to see. 1858, first comet to be photographed. Uh, and then we've got a uh, comet there that's responsible for the Ryrids. 1965, this one broke into three pieces. And here we've got one that disintegrated. But they're, they're all coming from sort of a uh, semi major axis within the Kuiper belt. Here's a uh, a picture of uh, 1861. Uh, two comets uh, came within a few months of each other. Uh, they came to perihelion actually within six days of each other in June 1861. Uh, the orbits are very similar. It was probably a binary object that uh, that came around the sun. Uh, got split apart as they came in. Uh, this is a, a, a drawing from the London Illustrated News uh, of 1861. Uh, and we're quite familiar now with these objects. I mean, Arakoth and quite a few of the comets. We can see that the made up of objects that are joined together, which seems to be uh, how things are put together. And it's probably giving us an indication of how the planets formed way back in the early solar system. So here's some uh, we're talking about these binary and uh, trans-Neptunian objects and also trans-Neptunian objects with moons. You've got Pluto. Uh, Pluto uh, is a, an excellent one that can be classed as a binary. Uh, they orbit around each other uh, at a point between the two objects. Uh, uh, the orbital, uh, the common point of orbital uh, position is not within the planet, is it? Earth and the Moon, the Moon orbits around a point that's within, contained within the Earth's physical shape, uh, whereas Pluto and Charon, the, the common, uh, they, they orbit around a common point that is uh, between the pair of them. Uh, Pluto, and you see there's got five moons, uh, Four of them are fairly tiny. There may be actually bits of Sharon from a, an impact. But there's, uh, there's other ones. Uh, Lempo, uh, it's a, a binary pair. Uh, it's there, are 200, 250 kilometers in diameter, the pair of them. Uh, they're only about 800, 900 kilometers apart. Uh, they orbit around each other in uh, just under two days, but there's a, a third body that orbits around the pair of them. Uh, half the size, 7,000 kilometers away and takes 50 days to go around. So 
Uh, it's a bit of a strange double, triple system. Uh, it's a it's a Plutino. It orbits every 39.2 AU around the sun. Come here. Uh, it's got a ring. Uh, it's elliptical in shape. It's uh, from what our measurements have so far, it's 2,000 kilometers by 1,500 by 1,000. Uh, it's got moons and a ring. Uh, so, uh, again, a quite an interesting object. The ring is probably due to a collision between uh, bodies, but it's uh, it's orbit the ring particles orbit in a, a three to one resonance with the uh, the rotation of uh, the asteroid itself. And that's just a list of some more binaries or Kuiper belt objects with moons. You can see that it's not an unusual thing for these things to have moons. Uh, and some of these moons are, I mean, count, count them as double planets, double objects, 280 and 230, 200 and 190. 250, 230. So the two objects that are similar size rotating around a common center of mass. Uh, and some of these are quite clear. I mean, here you've got one. Uh, the primary is 420 kilometers in diameter. The orbit is only just a bit bigger than the size of the primary. So this moon is, is almost scraping the surface of. Uh, it's primary as it goes round. So, what can we see? Can we see them? Well, Pluto uh, comes into opposition in July, uh, magnitude 14.9. It's in Sagittarius, so good luck with that. Uh, and then the others, Maki Maki, Homeo, and Eris, very faint. Uh, I mean, again, uh, I don't think it's uh, the, the the objects really for small telescopes. If you've got a nice big scope and uh, a camera, um, you may be able to 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 get something of these things. Uh, Maki Maki, twenty. Well, we just missed that twenty seventh of March. Omea comes into opposition in a in a couple of weeks' time, and then Eris uh, is in opposition in October. So. While well, we're here, we'll have a quick look at Pluto. Uh, the uh, New Horizons probe went and gave us a taste of a, a Kuiper belt object. Uh, we've got some really interesting pictures. We've got this red tint, which is uh, due to these tholins, these uh, materials connected with the, the sunlight. We've got this uh, famous white heart, which is uh, nitrogen ice. Apparently nitrogen ice is supposed to have the consistency of something like silly putty at uh, the temperatures of Pluto. Uh, but uh, on the photographs we, we seem to have a, a former lake, frozen lake of uh, liquid nitrogen. Uh, it may have been liquid in Pluto's past if the atmosphere was a bit thicker. Uh, temperatures on Pluto can get as high as 55 degrees Kelvin. Nitrogen melts or sublimates at about 63. So it's quite possible that uh, the atmosphere may change uh, due to Pluto's orbit. Uh, the hot region, we have this lava lamp effect where the frozen nitrogen seems to be slowly moving up and down causing uh, these uh, these shapes uh, uh, putting up against this these are thought to be actually uh, mountains and rocks made out of actually water ice water ice is a, a rock at these temperatures Pluto's got clouds so we can see clouds on the the photographs taken by new horizons uh, nitrogen haze over the surface. Uh, again, this is thought to be a cloud here. And then methane snow on the tops of its mountains.
and has it got uh, old riverbeds from liquid nitrogen with these these strange sinuous markings on the surface <coughs> what is thought to be uh, the remains of an ice volcano whether it's still active or not uh, with a sort of the, the vent in place and then this sort of snake skin uh, material uh, surface that's thought to be sublimated ice probably nitrogen or even uh, methane ice and a similar sort of thing happens on the earth uh, this is uh, in uh, the mountains in south america in the andes and basically because the atmosphere is so thin uh, water ice is actually sublimating straight into the atmosphere and you get these sort of shapes and um, this is sort of reminiscent of of this type of uh, feature on Pluto so maybe this is sort of sublimation of nitrogen ice or or methane ice into the atmosphere of uh, Pluto and of course as we as we said bye bye to Pluto we, we saw the atmosphere backlit uh, Pluto had got moons, Sharon, uh, here's uh, Sharon and a large object of its own, 90,000 kilometres across, red tholins on the sun. I often wonder, and uh, nobody's actually said otherwise, uh, whether something's actually impacted the bottom of Sharon. Uh, this surface here seems an awful lot older than this surface here, and uh, it looks like uh, this, this part, if I go back, this part here, the shape of that seems to be similar to the shape of that. Whether has that fallen away, uh, sort of as Sharon got split apart. Here it is again. That that shape there almost fits that. It's a bit like South America and uh, and uh, Africa. But other things is that a, a, is that a vent like there is on Pluto, a volcanic vent. And there's this strange object that nobody's been ex uh, been able to uh, explain where uh, something seems to have depressed the surface uh, sticking out of a, a hole this is a, a, a canyon uh, which is uh, about 430 miles long uh, and uh, it's thought to be as much as five five miles deep These are the other moons, Hydra and Nix, but they've done a spectrum of them. Here's a spectrum of pure ice, the white, and Sharon, Hydra and Nix, a lot of the, the shape of the, uh, the uh, spectra does seem to be equivalent to ice. Uh, one interesting thing about Arakos, um, as, uh, which was the next target for uh, New Horizons, before it got there, uh, there's an occultation of a star by Arakoth and uh, some uh, amateur astronomers uh, got together in uh, South Africa and uh, this is the, the tracing of, uh, of the star that was occulted and from that they could work out that they thought it might be a binary, they got this shape but when we actually now look at the correct shape of uh, Arakoth uh, they actually weren't too bad, so uh, it's a plus mark for amateur astronomers. Well done, lads. So this is Arakoth. Uh, it's basically two objects that seem to have come together. Uh, you've got this sort of flat, flattish uh, lump here, and another more rounded area that's come together, joined by a a sort of a, a neck. Uh, we saw this sort of thing uh, with some of the comets. Uh, the uh, the Ro Rosetta mission comet had a, a similar sort of orientation of two bodies coming together. Uh, so that was sort of the original view of it, two objects like that, but it's now thought to be two objects like that and they've just come together gently. Uh, at, uh, as they, they orbited around each other and, and stuck. 
and it's got a complex geology. So it's made up of uh, different things. Uh, so, uh, so a lot of these earlier building blocks that's come together, you can see the shapes here on the photograph. There's things like seem to have sort of stuck together and then get covered in uh, some sort of regolith, uh, which uh, helps these uh, these bodies. Uh, in comparison, here I've got uh, Comet uh, 67P from the Rosetta mission um, in size comparison. So. Uh, uh, Arikos is 30, 30 odd kilometers across. It's quite a, a large object. So, any more for New Horizons? Well, <coughs> it's, uh, it's past Arikos well by. Uh, it's now 55 uh, AU from Earth. It's in the sort of the, the Kuiper Cliff region. They've not been able to find anything to uh, uh, fly by again. Uh, there's only 11 kilograms of fuel left. Uh, there was talk that they may try and turn it round and repeat the, uh, the, the the famous blue dot photograph that was taken by Voyager. Uh, as it went through, there was a number of objects it was going to pick up on, and a few days after. Uh, it passed uh, Arakoth. Uh, he photographed this object. This, this was a, had been a, a potential target. So 2014 OS. It's a binary object, two 30 kilometer diameter components. Uh, they orbit each other about 150 kilometers apart. So that's another Kuiper belt object that uh, New Horizons photographed. And uh, so, in summary, there's lots of stuff out there. We've only started to scratch the surface of what's, uh, what's visible. Uh, quite a lot of them are in resonant orbits from Neptune, which seems to suggest uh, how the planets moved around in the early solar system, Neptune being thrown out to a certain extent to its position it is now. Uh, are these bodies comets or asteroidal? I mean, if some of these bodies came into the inner solar system, would they sort of degas? Uh, I suspect yes, because the, the nitrogen would serve off quite easily. Lots and lots of binaries, which gives, I think, some sort of clue on how the early solar system came together. It was more crowded, that they would sort of join together. And we see this sort of joining together. Arakoth and other bodies seem to seem to be lumpy and put together. And what happens further out is that does the hills cloud, hills disk exist, does the Oort cloud exist? Uh, what's happened to the Oort cloud over the lifetime of the solar system? I mean, my, my view is that it's probably been messed around by close approaches by other stars. Um, we may have shared material, so some of the stuff out there we may have gained from another star and we may have given other stars some of our material. So that is it. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll try and stop the share and uh, put you back. I stop the share. There we go. I stop the share. Okay, it's back to you, Chris. Lovely. Thank you very much, Roy. Thank you very much indeed. Wonderful. Um, when we have our live meetings, we immediately give a round of applause before we ask any questions. It's not so easy uh, with Zoom, but nevertheless, and uh, we'll give you a, a if we can do the uh, if I can find the reactions as well. There we are. So everybody, a big round of applause for Roy. What a wonderful talk. Thank you very much indeed. It's not quite the same as being in a room, is it? But it's the best we no. can do. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, fascinating. I, you know, I knew a little bit about the Kuiper Belt, and I said at the beginning that we're going to know a lot more about it at the end, and how right I was. That was wonderful. I, I had no idea even about the, that, that there were so many categories and sort of subgroups. I I knew about the Trojans, I think, and uh, 
the Lagrange points and those that circled in the same orbit as the host. But all of those segmentations, those different types and characteristics according to how many AUs out they are and the relative and those resonances as well. I had no idea about that, that there were so many resonant orbits, uh, with, again, with relation to the, the major, uh, you know, gas giants and things like that, Neptune, etc. Absolutely fascinating. Um, my, I've got one question and I'll hand it over to everybody else. The, you, you, you described the, going right back to the beginning, the asteroid belt and then, of course, the Kuiper belt as, as, as toruses, uh, which is a kind of donut shape, isn't it, essentially? Yeah roughly in the general ecliptic, although you showed quite clearly that there was a kind of 20 degree variation up and down, but basically a donut or a torus. And um, with the Oort yeah, it, it was a rough calculation. I mean, basically, I just wanted to do the sort of calculations you do on the back of an envelope. So yeah, uh, I, I sort of 20, deg 20 degrees would cover 85, 90 percent of the asteroids. Yeah, that's sure. So it, it was just Put it in a box and try and work some figures out really but just for interest sake um so what i was what i was wondering was um I'm, just, i know your talk is really about the type of but you you brought in the Oort cloud as well and showed the relative distances how much further out the Oort cloud is. am i right in thinking that the Oort cloud is not a torus or a donut that that is actually more of a bubble more of a complete circular but the, 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 the talk of the Oort cloud is that it, it's actually just a, a random sphere, around, which Rough, yeah. I must admit it puzzles me because when we do these infrared photographs of uh, stars out in the Milky Way, uh, we just see disks. Uh, they don't see a sort of stuff all the way around. So. I'm not convinced by the Oort cloud. Uh, you probably gathered from the talk. It's uh, it's something I'd, I'm not quite sure exists. I mean, in my own mind, uh, we get lots of passages by other stars uh, coming near the sun. Uh, for example, uh, I, I didn't put it in the talk, but um, uh, about seven and a half million years ago, and it's a long time ago, uh, the star Algol, uh, the demon star, it passed within about seven light years of the sun. Now that star system, it's, uh, it's a triple, it's at least a triple star system with a lot of mass. It's about mass seven, mass eight of the sun. So even at seven light years, that would have probably had a greater gravitational pull on the Oort cloud than Alpha Centauri's having. Yeah. Uh, you know, so these sort of passages happen in a sense in, in uh, galactic time quite frequently. And in four and a half billion years, uh, something larger has possibly passed close by, uh, taking stuff away. We've probably gathered stuff. Uh, I mean, we're now detecting these uh, interstellar comets. I mean, that, that long thing in which with the unpronounceable name on a mirror or or whatever. Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, had that by, been disturbed for something in our old cloud or, you know, they, they say, well, it, it came from elsewhere. And there may be a lot of stuff from elsewhere. A lot of these comets that we've seen coming in, uh, I mean, the, the one you talked about earlier, um, that's uh, just been discovered. I mean, that's a long period comet. Did that exist in the Oort cloud or has that actually come from somewhere else in the, in the Milky Way? Uh, you know, uh, I, I, I have a big question mark of the Oort cloud uh, in its existence. Yeah, the periods of, of some are so great that they're just estimates. And once yeah. it gets beyond the, you know, many, many tens of thousands of years, um, there's a possibility that it is actually the first time it's ever been into the sun, and they're actually wandering comets. We just don't know, do we? Um, so, you know, true. If you, if you look at one of those um, slides I had, uh, there was a comet on there that was supposed to have a feeling distance of, of seventy-four. 
thousand AU, which is actually beyond uh, what's considered to be the outer edge of the um, Oak cloud. Oak cloud, yeah. So, you know, uh, where did that come from? Uh, and if something's that far out, it's it really is going to get disrupted. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating stuff. Well, thank you for that. Um, I'm going to hand over to the floor. Has somebody got a question for Roy about tonight's talk? Yeah, hi, Roy. Um, I couldn't see it on the grass, but because of the size and mass of Jupiter, are there residences of trans-Neptunian objects due to Jupiter? None that anybody's found. It's all, all down to Neptune. Right. Uh, obviously, Jupiter, I think Jupiter has more of a effect <laughs> with the stuff that comes inside Neptune's orbit. Uh, I mean, Neptune is strange from the other giants is that it's got Trojans. Uranus, we've not found any, really. Uh, Saturn, we've not found any, really. Uh, Mars, I think they've got a couple of little ones. Uh, we've got a couple of strange ones, the uh, Cruethne, which is sometimes called Earth's second moon. Uh, but, I mean, Jupiter knocking on for 10,000 Trojans. Uh, I mean, Jupiter is sort of ruling the roost, and I, th I think it, it just knocks the other. Tr the because the problem with Trojans is, I mean, it's nice to think that they sat nicely at L4 or L5, but actually the orbits are quite eccentric and move in and out a lot. Um, uh, the, the, uh, there's a there is a, a couple of Martian Trojans, but one of them actually approaches the Earth and, and actually gets nearly out to, uh, gets into the, into the asteroid belts. So it's got quite a wide orbit, even though it's got the same period of Mars and, and is technically a Trojan. Well, you know, it's, uh, uh, some of these Trojan orbits are not very stable. Mm. So you, you you obviously show quite a lot of those resonances. Um, are all the all are all the objects in some sort of resonance orbit or no. high proportion or no? The classical ones are not in resonance. So Arakoth is not in a, a resonance. That's called a cold classical. So it's in an orbit that was there before Neptune moved. Uh, it's got a very low inclination, it's got a very low eccentric, I think the eccentricity is something like 0.05. Uh, so basically it's been sedately going around the sun in its orbit, undisturbed by the motion of Neptune. Uh, so it's called the hot, so it's, that's a cold classical, it's classical because it's within the classical uh, Kuiper belt, but the hot classicals are thought to have been stuff that's been pushed out. Their uh, semi major axis is within the classical Kuiper belt. Uh, sorry, my antivirus just popped up a screen thing. Uh, is within the uh, Kuiper belt, but they've got a high eccentricity. Uh, so uh, they, they can dip in inside Neptune, just like Pluto does. Pluto dips inside uh, Neptune's orbit because it, it's got a, a fairly large eccentricity. Uh, and, and some of these have got fairly high inclinations, 20 degrees, uh, 30 degrees, some of them. So the hot ones are, seem to be the ones that have been pushed out. Uh, the resonant ones are the ones that have been pushed out where they got stuck into uh, a resonant orbit and that and again you look at those resonance or resonant objects and they've got high eccentricities because uh, the semi-major axis has moved out but the uh, perihelion and, uh, hasn't moved out quite in line so it, it sort of stretched the, the orbit as they moved out and, and that's where the theory of this planetary drift back in four billion, four and a half billion years ago came from. Uh, 
again, I mean, I have reading the, the I don't understand how it got past Uranus, uh, Neptune. Uh, it's, uh, but maybe that's why Uranus tipped over. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And you look at the moons of Neptune and Uranus, and basically this rubber pile, they should have, they should have bigger moons if you're putting, you know, uh, than what they've got. I mean, I, I thought there was a paper back in the 80s that talked about the flip of Neptune going out flipping uranus and actually venus was also included as well they had some re really weird kind of uh dynamics to show that venus mm. itself was actually past mars and got some weird effect because of this mars uh, venus uh uranus got flipped over which is why it's sort of retrograde depending on how you determine it and likewise for venus yeah and and it was like i think it i think the theory was like Yes, the mass could prove that, but is that like it, it all became like pocket billiards? You could knock things around and come up with an answer, but is that really what happened? Who knows? Mm. Now I've never heard it ever come back again, but yeah. the the Uranus flipping Neptune has definitely been on the radar for quite a while. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of guesswork in this sort of stuff. Yeah. I mean, they talk about Venus also being hit by a, a, a silicate asteroid where the earth got one that regained the iron core which right. gave us our magnetic field venus got more of a, a ceres type asteroid not quite as big so it gave venus the thick crust and slowed it down right so venus only now rotates in what 228 days something like that so that's why it doesn't there's nothing stirring up the inner dynamo to give it a magnetic field Although it's now got 85,000 volcanoes, so... Well, yeah, but if you look at the volcanoes on Venus, they're, they're, they're all random. There's no continental yeah. drift or anything like that. So, but somebody's going to have a theory for anything. <laughs> I, I must admit, I've not heard that theory, Keith, but I mean, I mean, it's, I mean, Neptune flipping Uranus uh, is, sounds perfectly plausible. I mean, they're, they're you know, contiguous planets. Um, but it does sound a bit of a stretch to me to try and include the same perturbation, whatever it was, to explain Venus, even though there's two more, well, three more intervening planets, Mars, Jupiter and, and Earth, or Jupiter, Mars, Earth, I should say. Um, it sounds a bit of a stretch to me. I think we can just safely say, can't we, that some massive perturbation has taken place once, twice or maybe more to affect in particular those two planets, Uranus and uh, and venus quite dramatically to you know turn them on it on their side or in the case of venus on its head sort of thing yeah. but exactly what we, we probably will never know exactly yeah. anyway yeah fantastic anyone else with an, another question particularly about the kuiper belt yeah and yeah, really interesting that there are so many uh, more objects that are in plutonian resonance I, 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 any ideas why why there are so many there rather than any of the other two i love tutonian three tonian yeah. i've no idea i mean basically i mean what 390 uh that resonance that we've discovered i think the next one is the two tinos which i think it was 99 uh maybe when we get better telescopes we'll discover more at some of the other resonances um it's uh i mean they're very hard to detect i mean at least i mean what pluto those magnitude 16 15 16 at best uh a lot of the other stuff smaller it's the, the magnitude 19 20 very hard to see uh when we get sort of i don't know something i mean this vera robin telescope is supposed to be able to be uh, going to be the bee's knees at detecting uh, uh, objects in uh, sort of uh, asteroidal objects in the solar system and moons and what have you once it uh, it starts ticking away and uh, uh, it's robots i mean basically it's going to photograph the entire southern hemisphere sky every four days and then go back and do it again and every four days it it takes a photograph of the same spot of the sky 
and it's supposed to be able to get down to magnitude 28. So when that comes online, I, I suspect we'll get hundreds more Kuiper Belt objects being announced. Uh, there may well be as many in some of the other residences as ours at the Pluto. Um, I mean, that is one of the reasons why Pluto is not a planet, because it's not cleared out that orbit. Uh, but again, you can argue against the IAU on that definition for a planet and a, uh, a dwarf planet, because Jupiter hasn't cleared out its orbit, has it? It's got Trojans. Uh, you know, it's. Uh, I think the IAU is a bit like politicians. You know, they'll they'll state something to suit their case. Yeah, incredible. It's and I, just one thing, Roy. About like, you mentioned the Lagrange points, and uh, mm. I understand the basics of it and the balancing of two bodies producing a neutral kind of gravitational point. Mm. I mean, but. It is, I mean, the James Webb is actually at a Lagrange point, isn't it, I think? That's right, yeah. But Lagrange 4, maybe, is it, or 3, I can't remember, it's up beyond the moon, but... I thought it um, was at the, um, is it L2? It's the one L2, beyond the moon. yeah, the, the outside of the, the, the Earth, yeah. beyond the Earth, or so beyond the moon. The, 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 the L2, uh, the confined pull of the Earth and the Sun yeah. increases the gravitational pull, so the orbital speed at that is actually greater than if the Earth wasn't there. So yes. if it was just orbiting the Sun, it'd be going at one speed because the Earth is in line. There's a greater gravitational pull, so it increases the speed so it will move with the Earth at that distant orbit. That's yeah. the thing. It's not a very stable orbit. That's why they have to keep adjusting it. They have yeah. to keep tweaking it with the jets. But what I was going to ask was without going, because uh, I'm certainly not a, a mathematician or a the physicist, um, are Lagrange points identifiable in theory, no matter how eccentric an orbit is? I mean, obviously you've got to have the material and the objects there, but do they become less and less uh, prominent as the eccentricity of an orbit increases? Or um, it, are, is it... You've is got it, to have a fairly massive object to make it work, to, to, to get the minor objects in there. In comparison to, uh, you've got the major object, which is the sun, uh, the minor object, which is say the earth. So I think uh, where, where it's a 60 degree uh, position. So the earth's gravity has, has some effect, even at that distance, that the earth is a, a decent side. If the earth, if you get a smaller body, uh, like Mars, the pull is not so great. If that body is then in an eccentric orbit, what I would guess is that the uh, the area of influence to keep it in a, a Lagrange point would decrease as it went into uh, to a, a perihelion position, to a, an aphelion position. Um, there's a, a thing, a term called the Hill's radius. Uh, which is the distance from a body where it, something can orbit it and still be stable. So that the Earth's hills radius, I think it's just over a million miles. So the moon is safely within the hills radius of the Earth. If the moon was to move out beyond a million miles from the, the Earth, then its orbit would be subject to more pull from the sun and become unstable. And this applies to all the planets. This is why uh, Saturn has got uh, moons that go out fantastic. Some of these small asteroids that are orbiting Saturn go out quite some distance. Uh, I think there's one of something like 20 odd million miles from Saturn going around, around one of its little moons that goes around. It's a, a, quite, a, quite a distance away because it's, it's further from the sun, so that area of influence for Saturn is quite large. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a bit like balancing weights on a fulcrum, isn't it? You know, the longer yeah. the lever, 
uh, the less weight you need and the, the shorter the leave, the more mass or weight you need. It's just a balancing act, isn't it, really, in simple yeah. terms? Yeah, I mean, I mean, obviously, they, they do some clever mathematics. I, I don't quite understand the, the some of the mathematics because uh, they, they predict these things for thousands of years in the future. And, and one of the... When I used to work at the university, one of the things I got involved way, way back in the 80s was was thing uh, called finite elements, where you look at the structures of bridges and the stress of the strains, etc. <coughs> one of the problem was um, if you split that, say you were looking at uh, uh, a, a very simple uh, vibration problem on a, a bridge or a, a plate, and you used to break it up into little elements and then you, you, you'd use mathematics to uh, work out the motion of uh, these things but if you split that up too finely you'd get errors because yeah you truncate it in those days you truncate the decimal point you know you, you could do it today say 10 decimal places your mathematics but your 11th your computers are your compute computation couldn't deal with that 11 so it rounded up or rounded down and if you did the iterations too many times that error compounded right up so you got larger errors yeah. so you could only break an object up into so many elements before it, it gave itself more errors so uh if you were trying to do a calculation on something, making your calculation areas on your structure finer didn't necessarily make you were getting a, a better result. It actually made meant you're actually going to get a worse result. It was sort of a, a payoff. And there's a sort of an optimum size when you did the calculations of how you how you broke a structure up for your calculations uh, for the best result. Too few, you're getting a poor answer. Too many, you're getting a poor answer. Just so uh, the decimal point gets rounded up. Uh, so when they do these calculations and say, oh, we've calculated the orbit for five million years, I'm, I'm a bit wary uh, because uh, I'm not quite sure how good the supercomputers are. I mean, the, uh, the Met Office of Supercomputer can't predict the Okay. Anybody else? Anybody else got a question before we, we wrap up? We we got time if you want. Anyone? No, I think we're all done. Okay. Well, Roy, um, thanks ever so much. I think um you when you contacted me, you sent me a list of some other topics that you deal with as well. You've got some other yeah. talks, I think. So We'd like to possibly come back to you. Um, I'm currently composing our program into next year and sounds a long way off 2024, but it soon comes around. So maybe next year or even into our season after that, into the autumn of next year. But we'd love to have you back again for something else, if, if you would have us. <laughs> yeah, no problem at all. OK, so everybody again, once again, either with your virtual hands or with your real hands, can we give Roy a resounding Thank you very much, Roy. That was absolutely fascinating. Really enjoyed it. Thank and, you very um, much. I think we're done. So it only remains to me for me to wish everybody a very happy Easter. Stay safe. And I'll see you all in May. And Roy, thank you again. We'll see you again sometime soon. Cheers. Okay. All the best, thank everybody. You. Happy thank Easter. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.